Welcome to another episode of Redeeming Truth. We got an incredible question recently, and I'm going to talk about this a little more with Pastor John, our lead pastor here at Redeemer. And the question came from Canada, all the way north of the border, a pastor leader who's been watching and asked, how do you get a good small group ministry going at your church? Well, um, I've, I've listed a few thoughts. I, I know we agree on them, and, and they're practical, and there's certainly much more that can be said about this. But uh, John, why don't we start like this? I think the first thing that you want to do if you're looking to start a small group ministry at your church is agree on the model. Would you agree you've got you know Bible study model where people use you know curriculums and you've got sermon based? Uh, what did you choose here about four years ago? You were the first of all our team here. Uh, turnaround guy, revitalizing the work here. What did you choose and why? Yeah, we believe that um, small groups were going to be critical to help the church turn around. So the first thing that we did was we decided on the kind of groups we were going to do. And that was, at the time, it was we had four elders, so we were going to have four small groups. We were going to make them sermon-based, so the people were going to discuss various questions from the sermon on Sunday. And then the third thing, which is critical for us, was we said they're only going to be seven weeks. And so we wanted to give a, we wanted to do a, a, a soft launch. We wanted to do a dry run to see, okay, what can we learn? Mm. Because this church had never really had small groups the way we're gonna, we were going to do them. And the, the last time they had small groups was years earlier. So said, okay, we're going to just start over again, but we're just going to do a dry run and see what can we learn, the four of us, after seven weeks so that we can get it started in the fall. And so we did that in May of 15, and so that we could launch them by September of 15. I like that. I've, I've often thought about it because you've done, you were a small group guy at previous churches. I did the same thing at previous churches and or previous church. And one of the things that I've always thought through is, you know, life's not a curriculum. So neither should small groups be. And I know that's a strong statement. So you'll say, hey, curriculum's fine. I get that there's certain seasons, but in general, what you're preaching on a Sunday, I want to regurgitate on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. I want to be rehashing because if Peter said, it's no big deal for me to remind you, and Jesus repeated a lot, and Paul even said, you know, I'm going to remind you of these things, and John did, then I want to be reminded as well. So, you know, life groups or small groups being driven by a sermon, and then uh, certainly the other thing I used to say, and we call them growth groups here, but, you know, life groups or small groups at life's pace. You know, seven weeks or things in bite-sized seasons, everything in life is seasonal in a sense, and that's not to say that discipleship is seasonal, but growth group or small group is is not the only vehicle for discipleship but it's one that can help a lot and putting them in those seven weeks even trial runs or even now we do i think 13 week um uh, seasons giving people the option for summers and different things can be really helpful so there were two th main things that we learned when we did that for yeah. just for seven weeks having never done it before the first one was if i have a small group me personally it's going to be exponentially larger than the other. So mine was three to four times yeah. larger than everybody else's small group. <laughs> when the lead pastor launches the group. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we learned that, that John can't have a small group, or if he does, he needs to not lead the small group. Yeah. And then the second thing that we learned was that if we only had elders leading the small groups, then we were going to limit the, the amount of people that could, could legitimately be in a small group. That's really good. And so we had to say, okay, we're, we're, we're not going to create little churches out of our mm -hmm. small group so that right. there's 20, 40, 60 people in a small group because there's only so many elders. Yeah. We said, no, we're, we, need to, we need to look out at the entire church population and go, who are some people that we could really trust to be an extension of the elders as well as the elders leading groups? Excellent. Who else could we trust so that we could get more people in the groups? Awesome. So you just jumped us into, I think, points two and three. So if the first point would be agree and, and pick a model. Uh, two and three, a couple of different steps. Get the strategy and the structure on paper. So decide, are you going to cap the groups? How many groups? Where are they going to be? Is there a, a radius where people live in the church? And so there's that as well. Um, the faintest ink being better than the freshest memory. Put it on paper. Get a philosophy of ministry. Write it out and then implement it. And then you said mm -hmm. something that I think would be the third key thing. Mm -hmm. Identify your leaders. What are some of the bare minimums that you want to see in a small group leader? A, a member, uh, doctrinally aligned, speak to that and the importance of that. Because if you're preaching one thing in the pulpit, and then you've got a guy that goes, hey, you know, I know John said that about, uh, about works and all that and salvation being by grace. But, you know, I, I'm kind of an LDS guy. And I listen, there, there's some works you got to do. I mean, if a guy like that got into leadership... 
then you obviously didn't do number two right. You haven't put the philosophy on paper and made it clear. Speak to the importance of leadership and how it supports what you're doing in the pulpit. Yeah, so the growth group leaders need to be members. We want them to be uh, deacon qualified. Um, and members uh, in the early days had to sign the doctrinal statement. So they couldn't just agree like they do now. We, we say, hey, we, you can't teach against the doctrinal statement. Before it was like, you have to sign this. So that was another limiting factor on who could actually be a growth group leader, yeah. which made it so we couldn't have as many growth groups. But uh, we, we had, we, we've had what you're talking about. We had a, a group where a guy... Um, didn't agree with my teaching on the Trinity. He Yikes. believed that the, the Trinity was unbiblical and that there's really a binity, that there's just the Father <laughs> and the Son and the Spirit's not a person. Yes. And so he, he wanted to voice that opinion in the growth group, which he did. And uh, thankfully, he was saying that in the group of one of the elders, and the elder was able to, uh, to, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, you, you absolutely have to make sure that the people there are, are solid. So what I did in the earliest days, because I just gotten here, I hadn't even been here a year, I just said to the elders, hey, who are the men at this church who you think would be legitimately good growth group leaders because you know them. And yeah. so so they, they had to pass the bar of the elders as we were just getting started. Now we're four or five years into it, and so now we have other steps. But that was, that was key for us. Really helpful. So leaders are really the ceiling on the ministry in that sense, and then they're extensions of pastoral staff and, and elders and leaders. And so if you're going to be a frontline minister, goodness, you've got to you've got to agree with, with headquarters, Absolutely. so to speak. It wouldn't work in the military, and it ain't going to work in the church. Mm -hmm. um, four, train your leaders. Train the leaders. So you know what model you want. You've built the structure. You've got a philosophy. You've identified them. Now you've got to train them. Uh, speak to the importance of getting leaders doctrinally sound and even helping them relationally. Some people have anger issues. You could have all the sound doctrine in the world, but not know how to deal with conflict or conflict resolution or uh, emotions. Speak to the importance of having well-rounded leaders, but not having a bar so high that you know nobody can get in but you and Jesus. Yeah, so what we tried to do was we looked for people that were already serving in some capacity that people knew, so they would go, Oh, I, I know him. I want to sign up for his group. So that was the first thing then. And in those early days, I was leading the growth groups. And so that meant I was training them. So two, three, four times a year at first, I have a curriculum that I would walk them through. Everything from how to answer questions to how to do icebreakers, how to get people to know each other, to figuring out what the strengths of your group are for, for some outward focused projects, which we want people doing in our groups. And so there was, so there was training there. Then the next year we did it, it was once a month. All the growth group leaders were meeting with me in my office and then I would, I was answering questions from them. I, I'd have a small amount of stuff I wanted to cover and just said, okay, talk to me about what are you guys facing? What do you need help with? To go from there so so as that shifted once once you you have the stru the membership structure in place we went from there to okay now now i don't need to worry about that as much now i need to focus on okay how can i help them do what we're asking them to do it's really helpful so after you've identified the leaders train the leaders and then practically speaking that looks like um you know having regular meeting times and pouring in and then i like what you said not just bringing information and kind of fire hosing. That's important because you want to equip them. You don't want to ask them, hey, what do you guys want to do? But I do like what you said. After you've given them some of the important things you want to teach them, saying, what are the challenges you're facing? And that's really why we study and why we train and why we pray and why pastors want to gain some experience and learn from others is because you're constantly answering the questions and challenges of other people and helping them navigate conflict. So um, oh, wait, one, one yeah. more thing too, sorry. Uh, in those meetings, it was important for me that we all prayed for each other too. Wow. That there was a, a sense of camaraderie mm -hmm. that needed to be built, mm -hmm. a sense that we are together in this. And if there is something difficult going on in your life, if there's something difficult going on in your, in your group, we want to know about it. We want to pray about it. We want to pray for you and those people. So, so I didn't want those to simply be 
kind of a, a sterile, just kind of here, I'm the pastor, let me tell you. Mm. But I wanted there to be a sense that, no, we're, we're a family and we, we need to pray for each other about this. So nothing good is going to happen in any part of our church uh, in general, let alone in any specific group, unless we're, we're praying for these things. That's really healthy because small groups can sometimes be guilty of not praying enough. You do the questions, you do the icebreakers, you eat the food, you drink the coffee, you take your selfie, and then, cool, go home checkbox we did it prayer some some nights you know I, we'll talk about a book that has been helpful for us in a little bit but you know not being just a single issue crusader and jumping on rabbit trails not just being like a spreadsheet and going through the questions and then being done like a checkbox but actually um, being need-based and realizing hey there's a need here let's pray spending some nights in prayer can be the most helpful thing even if you didn't get to the questions so i love that you're doing that in training and then we also want that happening in groups. So um, the fifth and final practical step would be to affirm and assimilate. Kind of typical preachers, we assimilate or alliterate everything. Affirm and assimilate. Affirm meaning you in the pulpit are saying a watch in small groups and we're affirming it by putting tables out and by letting people know that we love them and we want them in community. And then assimilate meaning we have structures that actually get people into the groups. Speak about the on-ramps that we offer every year, multiple times a year. Yes. So if we wanted a growth group to start a whole session to start, let's say Labor Day weekend, then we would start four weeks before that to get people signed up to the groups. So the way we did it was we had it was the same time everywhere, 630. But the differences were the cross streets here in Arizona. Everything is cross streets. So people know, okay, this one's close to me and day of the week. So we, we asked our growth group leaders to spread out throughout the week so that it was, it was every night of the week, uh, Sunday night, except in those early days, there was none on, there wasn't one on, on Friday or Saturday. So there's other five days of the weeks we had groups and they were spread out all over the valley. And so we wanted to make sure that, that we had every night of the week covered. Yeah. And then we asked them to some of them to tell us, are you going to offer childcare or not? That was critical because people are looking at it going, are, are, is there going to be something for my kids during that time? Then we've done things where the first week is everybody comes and the second week just the men come, mm -hmm. third week just the women come, and then the fourth week is off or the fourth week is, is dinner and you don't, you don't go through your, your questions. So, so we've given a lot of freedom. A lot of freedom for structure. And how Absolutely. That, so. And so we, so we will do those on ramps once or twice a year just to get people in as we are able to, to recruit more leaders. To, to take more groups and I guess going back to your, your third one um, the most important thing other than being doctrinally sound for a growth group leader is that they 100% support the leadership mm. that is absolutely you support us doctrinally great but do you support the leadership do you support us as leaders because you can have a doctrinally sound person who can just turn their growth group into a let's destroy the, the church meeting, yeah. you know, or let's point out everything we don't like meeting. And that is eventually going to come. I mean, Titus 3 is clear that that is cause for church discipline. It's a factious man. Absolutely. And so we, so when it comes to what, what are we looking for in leaders, do you agree with us doctrinally? But then second, are you, are you with us? You know, and so it was, it was assessing the, the people here and asking the elders, hey, who are the men who, who aren't just, can't just sign our doctrinal statement, but, but are they with us? Amen. That's a good word. Well, I wanted to put two books in front of yeah, awesome. viewers that will be really helpful. The first is Sticky Church by Larry Osborne. Um, Larry Osborne's kind of a, a leadership, innovative guy with small groups. Their church has done a fantastic job. They have... Uh, a minimum of 80% of their members in small groups, and it really uh, stays in the 90s, but their uh, growth groups pastor works hard. That means they're going after people all the time, trying to get them in groups, launching new leaders. But Sticky Church is a book that has structure, uh, the why behind it, and then there's a lot of practical tools that you can use. And then uh, in true Larry Osborne fashion, I think you would say plagiarize and customize. You know, take what works, and leave out what might not in your context. But overall, use a book like that, Sticky Church by Osborne. And then um, just in case you feel the temptation to think, well, small groups are the ticket for me not dealing with people. You know, let all of them do it. The Trellis and the Vine, uh, a ministry mind shift that changes everything by Colin Marshall and Tony Payne will remind you that people are not giving units 
Uh, they are not just numbers. They're not even just butts in seats. They're souls. Uh, they are people that we must be discipling. And so a book like this will keep your perspective intact while you implement some incredible structures that Sticky Church offers. If you have more questions about ministry or practical ideas you'd love us to chime in on, you can email those questions to info at redeemeraz.org. And we'll be back very soon with another episode of Redeeming Truth.